woman who goes on the internet or on Twitter and says, oh, I'm a sex toy reviewer. Oh, I got off so hard with this sex toy. It was fabulous. A guy does the same thing. <laughs> not the same. Not the same. Men are expected to do things. They're sure. not expected to just sit and have pleasure. Um, yeah. I, fair, fair enough. I mean, if you looked at my desk right now, I've got my little... Hello, you delicious people. Welcome back to another episode of Intimate Conversations. And this is going to be a delicious, steamy conversation with someone who has been like in my world for a while, but I've never had the pleasure of having him on our show. So today, the amazing Dr. Stephen Snyder. Now he is the Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. We were just talking, I went to Columbia a while back. Um, his practice is entirely devoted to sex and relationship issues. And he's been a frequent guest on all the big mucky mucks, the NBC Today, the Goop podcast, a regular contributor to Huffington Post, Psychology Today. And he's written for the Times of London, AARP, Reader's Digest, Brides Magazine. New York Magazine, and he's been interviewed by the New York Times, the Atlantic L, Cosmo, Vogue, and many, many others. And get this, even in 2012, he hosted the Dolce & Gabbana's international launch of their new fragrance, Desire. And so now we're up to 2018, and he was awarded the Nautilus Gold Book Award for Relationships and Communication for his first book, get this, Love Worth Making, How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a long lasting relationship. And uh, Christiane Northrup, she's been on the show twice. She calls it hands down, the most practical, fun and empowering book I've ever read on how to have a fabulous sex life in a committed relationship. And Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer Ashton from ABC's Good Morning America wrote, love worth making does for sex therapy, what Hamilton did for the Broadway musical. Okay, got shivers on that one. This <laughs> playful yet, <laughs> this playful yet profound book reminds us that sex should be easy and can be once we learn to get out of our own way. So I feel like I just want to jump through all the way to Manhattan and give you a nice hug oh, and you, uh, a gratitude for taking time out of your very busy day to be with us. So That's how how has today been? Just today, how's today been for you? <laughs> it's been good, been good, yeah. Are you back to back all day doing interviews? Back to back all, all, all day long, just seeing patients mostly. Oh, really? Oh yeah, yeah. That's mostly all I do. I'm just a doc in the office. Um, just, just a doc in the office, and just a doc in the office. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah. How did you decide that sex was your path? I mean, of course, we all love sex, but like, how did now, you? You know, as, as you know, all of us in the field, we wonder why anybody else would do anything else for a living. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I was a, I was a doctor, and it was okay. And I just had this crazy idea to be a psychiatrist, um, and it was a terrible. I hated being a psychiatrist, um, and. Uh, and I thought, what else could I do with it? And somebody said, well, how about sex? I thought, you could do that for a living? I am so there. Yeah, it's just talk dirty and make people happy is the best. You know, it's so funny you say this because when I was a little girl, I was a dancer, like ballet, jazz, yeah. tap, et cetera. And then you're supposed to grow up and have like a job that's like serious. I'm like, no, I want to be a dancer like my whole life. So I, I did. The dance for, thing. Yeah, yeah. For a period of time, I lived in Tokyo and I was a topless dancer and a cabaret dancer. And that's when I first learned that my body was a divine temple. I didn't learn that in North America. I grew up in Canada, but these French girls, they really believed that our bodies were divine temples and that sex was sacred. But of course, this is how it is. And uh, I learned, I was like, whoa, this is a different point of view. Huh. So I know that you said, well, I could be a doctor and I could be a doctor about sex, but like, how did you grow up with stigma taboo was sex talked about in your household or or not i kind of grew up in the 70s uh and, and in the 70s uh i was a teenager in the 70s and uh all the uh all the grown-ups kind of went nuts for a while in the 70s and everybody was you know smoking dope and uh, you know just uh, kind of hanging out with indian gurus and stuff that it was a whole wild time so there was not a lot of stigma and taboo nice yeah. nice and so tell us if you're uh, willing, like your personal relationships, what's it like to be with a man who talks about sex all day? <laughs> <laughs> My kids love it. Yeah. yeah. They're in college now. Yeah. They love it. They like, they, they, they oh yeah. Daddy's going to talk about sex. Yeah. They love that. They love that. That's um, 
it, and um, my wife likes it as, as well. Um, the uh, she uh, it, she she made me take out uh, a certain thing that I wrote though in the uh, acknowledgement section of the book. Um, I said, you know, thank you to my wife uh, who uh, putting up with what, what we sex therapists do, which is sometimes when it's really good afterwards, we go, that's it. You go write something down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, don't put that. You can, no, you can talk to Alana about that, but don't put the name book. Oh, that's so cute. It's funny. Um, Garrett Gunderson, he uh, is an author and he also did a stand up show in Salt Lake a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And his wife was in the front row and he was talking about sex in Paris. They'd gone to like the, I don't know, the Moulin Rouge or something. And she's like, so you could just hear like, stop, stop, stop sharing. <laughs> no, actually my, my daughter is, my daughter, you know, is on page nine of my book. Um, it begins actually in her uh, grade school classroom. No. And, uh, yeah. And that everybody's going around uh, and asking talking about what their father does for a living. Yeah. And my daughter, uh, my daughter says her father's a psychiatrist and she plays it chill. And her best friend seated behind her goes, he's a sex therapist. And the class <laughs> goes berserk. And finally, after all the hubbub dies down, uh -huh. one little child in the corner goes, what does he do? <laughs> and so I say, wait, that's what we're going to talk about in this book. And, no. and what I talk about is well, mostly what I do as a sex therapist, I talk, listen to people talk about bad sex. Yeah. That's basically what you do as a sex therapist. You hear a lot of, a lot of bad sex. Yeah. So um, I know more about bad sex than anybody in the world. I've just heard about bad sex for 30 years. So it's one of the things that makes it so nice. You can just help people not have bad sex. Yeah, I get it. So you read all those you were saying before the interview started, a bunch of like boring sex books. Oh my God, forget it. I've read more boring sex books than, than you could imagine. It's a crime. It's just a crime. And so you have a great sense of humor. Well, and I'm glad if, if, if people couldn't have fun reading it, it was ridiculous. And the other thing, um, one of the things I talk about in the book is that the sexual self is different from your regular self. Tell me more. Psychologically, it's regressed. It doesn't function on an adult level. You know, you're really into your partner, but like at that moment, you don't really want to hear about their day. You just want no. them to make nice noises and tell you you're the most wonderful person in the world. Yes. And so that's a very infantile state of mind. Mm. And that sense of absorption in the moment, which characterizes mm. really great sexual arousal, where you get this fusion of the emotional and the physical, that's a very, very infantile state of mind. It's a really kind of a, a, a reawakening of uh, nonverbal memories from very, very early on in, in maternal fetal, you know, in not fetal, maternal infant life. Um, baby at the breast. It's really baby at the breast. And so uh, I kind of joke, I said the next sexual self is never older than two years old. And the problem with most sex books is they don't talk to the sexual self. Hmm. They talk to the adult self. They say, did you know the clitoris has 9,000 er nerve endings? And like, who gives a damn? Um, yeah. And they're talking about all this stuff. And there was a study done by Syracuse University where they found that women are 34%. Oh my God, you guys, you just do not know what you're talking about. So I decided to read out all the numbers and all the studies and all the statistics and everything. We're just going to talk to the sexual self. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep, so let's, let's be two-year-olds. Yeah, Steve. absolutely. Let's just be two-year-olds and talk. That's, that's, that's where it's at. That's where it's at. Okay. The, the biggest one um, is, you know, I read in book after book after book, you know, it takes work. You got to work on your sexual relationship. And I go like gag me with a spoon. Yeah. What hell are they talking about? I yeah. can't figure out what it's like, what it's, what it's all about to work on your sexual relationship. It sounds like the most boring thing in the world. Yeah. And so uh, that's the major thing that I talk about. One of the major things I talk about in the book is that if you're working on your sexual relationship, you're doing it wrong. Uh, because two-year-olds have no idea what the word work even means. <laughs> thank you. That's what it means. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so uh, the book begins uh, with uh, uh, a section entitled, Your Wife is Not a Lawnmower. And it's, I'm talking to a couple and I say, okay, now tell me about foreplay. And she goes, well, you know, he touches me and then I touch him. And like, you kind of know what they're talking about that he kind of between her legs, he does a little something and she grabs his penis and does a little something. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how too many couples do it. You know, they just kind of get the job done, get him hard and get her wet. I can say that on this show, right? Absolutely, yes. Get her hard and get her wet so yeah. that they can have intercourse. And 
it, it, it reminded me of, of when I was growing up uh, in the suburbs and seeing a guy trying to start up a gas lawnmower, you know, he just got to pull the thing right, you know, and guys are reading books about technique, she can stroke it here, she can stroke it there, and there's like technique, 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 and, and you can go on the web and get a million techniques, and it totally misses, it just totally misses, because what people miss is that it's not about doing something for your partner. That is just like totally the wrong way. I always mm -hmm. ask guys, when you touch her body, are you doing it for your pleasure or hers? And they kind of get those super They go, well, for hers, of course, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Like, I don't want to be selfish or anything. And I go, oh my God, you finally, you missed the boat. Because no hero in a romance novel ever rips the woman's clothes off and then says, now tell me how you want to be touched. I mean, it's nice to know, but usually what partners want, they want passion and passion is selfish. Two-year-olds are selfish. So if you're trying to be a generous lover, you're usually missing the boat. Wow. This is so great. I love my partner's cock. I just get so turned on. I'm just, it's all, about, I have so much fun and me having so much fun. I mean, oh I'll God. literally orgasm just myself having so much fun. Yeah, because that is really, really unusual. As you know, not yeah. that many women are into men's penises. I, um, I always, yeah, but you're an exception. Um, I always say if a man really wants somebody to adore his penis and worship yeah. it and just yep. like celebrate every moment that he has with it, he should be gay. <laughs> because I mean, they have an, a big advantage because gay men love penises. This is true. This they is true. Penises, but there are not that many women that love penises. As a matter of fact, at a sex, I talk about this in the book, at a sex therapy meeting, sex therapy meetings are 90% women. 10% men, um, and most of the men are gay. Um, there are not that many of us straight guys. And so um, there is no surer way to turn off the audience mm. of 90% women than to start talking about penises. You start talking about 90% about penises, 90% of the audience, their eyes glaze over. They're not interested <laughs> in penises. And so you're an exception. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say, though, it's not always been like that. This is, uh, I'm finally a, at 51. He has an exceptional penis. He does have an, ex I will say he has a beautiful penis. Right. Um, but it's, it's more, I think, Dr. C, it, it's, it's more about my willingness to be myself. Uh -huh. Joy, being me, being like, I'm 51 now and I don't care about pleasing. Like, am I good enough anymore? Exactly. Like so, so much of my own uh, evolution as a sexual being and as a woman, I've been, I've had horrible things happen. I've like fallen out of this or failed at this. And now I'm just like, screw it. This is me. This is how I am. And I love, I just love adoring his penis. I well, just not, well, it sounds like what you love about it is that it gets you into a state of arousal. Definitely. It makes me, makes me feel sexy, makes me feel aroused, makes me feel like I have all, I, you know what it is? I never, I'm so glad we're talking about this. I have never trusted a man and been devoted to a man like him. Okay. So he, that is an, ex, his penis is an extension of how I worship his soul. I know maybe that sounds kind of deep, but that's yeah. kind of how it is. You like probably physical, also, tell me if this is correct. You probably also appreciate that he's hard because you know, he's hard because of you. Yes. I like to be the most important woman in his life. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're at an infantile level, it's the only woman. Yes. At an infantile level, it's it's the baby at the breast. It's mother and baby looking into each other's eyes, and there is no one else in the universe. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. that's how I feel. That's how much he loves me. Yeah, and exactly. How good and safe I feel. And how wonderful your body is because it made him hard. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it sounds like a really nice experience. And uh, the other thing, which I talk about, is uh, the, the, uh, there's an equation, which is this deep equation, woman's body, man's penis. Tell me more. Um, if you ever look at what they have on porn, yes. the camera eats up the woman's body. Yep. The camera can't get enough of the woman's body. The camera doesn't really care about the man's body. All the camera cares about Unless, it, you know, gay porn is a little different. You're going to see his pecs and so forth. But heterosexual porn, all you're going to see is his penis. It's like that's him in miniature. Yeah. Um, yeah. And tremendously popular form of porn is blowjob videos. Yeah. It's an amazing thing because, you know, guys just, I, guys in my, 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 in my practice, they just love, love, love blowjob videos. 
And I always ask myself, now, what is it about blowjob videos? In a blowjob video, you're seeing a woman in a state of adoration. Yeah. Man's penis. Yep. Now, that's not something that most men who are straight ever experience. So wow. it's, it's this primal craving. Wow. To someone adore their penis, perhaps like as your mother adored your body. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say that the, the, the origin of this is like a mother enjoying her baby's feet. Now, obviously, that's not erotic um, in, a, in a strict sense of the word. She's not trying to give the baby pleasure. She's just taking pleasure herself mm. from the fact that the baby has such cute feet. Mm. But the baby is really appreciating it because the baby is experiencing on a nonverbal level that this person, whoever they are, takes joy in his existence. Yes. That's yes. really the essence of great sex is that somebody's taking joy in the fact that you exist. Yeah. You that's do anything. So that's that's really that's really the, the roadmap. That's the goal that you want couples to get to. You just yeah. take joy in the fact that the other person's exists. And what you're enjoying is really just the feeling that it's producing in you. It's really fundamentally very selfish. Yeah. But healthy selfish. I literally just did an IG live a minute ago about being healthy selfish. Like selfish itself has such a negative connotation. Yeah. Well, but isn't there the, the, the phrase the phrase that I sometimes use is selfishly connected. Mm, you're nice. Selfish, you're connected through selfishness. So mother it, biting her baby's feet, you know, nibbling on them and so forth. Um, it's a selfish act. She's not doing yeah. it to give the baby pleasure. She's doing no. it to give herself pleasure. Totally. But there's a connection that's going on. Yes. Where she's enjoying. It's like it's like if you're getting a massage, unless this would be too weird. If you're getting a massage and you feel that the masseur or masseuse is really enjoying it and is enjoying yeah. your body, and that's a that's a fabulous experience for most people. You know what I do in massages? I say to the universe, all the energy of the universe, pull through the back of the heart of the masseuse through their arms onto my body so that the masseuse is filled and I receive the whole universe's love. That's what I do. Wow. Okay. I'm going to use that. It, it apparently makes the masseuse, because I didn't tell them I'm doing this, have all this energy and want to give you more, like 10 minutes over or whatever. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's so they can feel it. Yeah. Okay. Energy is real. Okay. So here we go. It's a woman's body, pleasure in a woman's body and pleasure in a man's penis. Now, as a woman, it took me a while to not go, oh my God, he's looking at my cellulite. Oh my God, I have a muffin top. Oh my God, my boobs after giving birth, now they're small, yeah, yeah. you know, or feeding, whatever. So for, for me to receive his pleasure with my body, I have to let that in. So I got to do my work. Oh, uh, which work? What do, you, what do you say to women who are ashamed of their body or want the lights out or- Okay, now here's, here's, here's what I say. Um, men are different than women. <clears throat> and I'm going to be really politically incorrect here. Okay. Because okay. there are lots of exceptions. And I, I always say as a sex therapist, you really go watch it because there are exceptions. And if you don't acknowledge the exceptions, the exceptions will flame you on Amazon. Yeah. Um, but so there's lots of exceptions. So, so that be that as it may, this is a generalization. It's as worthless as any other generalization, but it's true. Okay. okay. Um, Women notice everything. Women really, really, a woman walks into the room, she notices everything. She notices every body. She has much more developed sensory apparatus and the processing speed to process it, the broadband to process all of that. Yep. And it's exhausting. Um, and I, I, I really do sincerely believe that the average man could spend a half an hour inside the mind of the average woman. He would go, this is exhausting. How do they do this all day? And that if the average man could spend, uh -huh. the average woman could spend an hour inside the mind of the average man, they'd go, oh, it's like I'm on vacation. <laughs> it's so peaceful. <laughs> it's, it's so peaceful in there. So the man does not really know it. No, he's not. No, every once in a while, maybe. But the other thing about women is a lot of things have to be. Uh, have to be just so in order to facilitate desire. She has to be happy with this, and you know her feet can't be cold, and the guy can't have put a, his socks on the floor because that's going to spoil the whole mood. I, I got a whole thing of the whole neurobiology of socks on the floor. It's different. From <laughs> you know? I never have a man complain about the woman's socks on the floor, but they, they're, they're noticing all this stuff, you know, and you gotta, <laughs> all these things, you know, it's like Emily Bianagoski, she says, you know, all the birds got to fly in the same direction, you know, that's really hard to do. <laughs> men are not like that. They're really uh -huh. not like that. What men are like, we're fetishists. Okay. You know, like a foot fetish. Yeah. You know, get the feet, nice feet. He's good. doesn't matter what else is going on. He's good. Um, 
And uh, most guys are, you know, breasts and butt fetishes. Yeah. And that's just their fetish. And yeah. they're built that way. And yeah. you give them the breasts and the butt and they're good. Now, the vaginas, they vary. Some guys get turned on vaginas. Some guys get turned off by vaginas. Some guys are neutral on vaginas. That's a whole variable thing. But breasts and butt, usually, they're good. Okay. Um, and uh, so uh, <laughs> if a guy's smart, he's chosen a woman that he likes her scent. That's important. Yes. yes and true. he likes basically how she's put together. He likes okay. it, kind of the shape of her nipples. And he likes kind of the shape of her butt and her figure and so forth. And it kind of like fits his fetish. So, okay, maybe some of the tales have changed, but she's basically his fetish object, and that doesn't change that much. And he's okay. not really noticing that much because we don't, we really don't think that hard. And <laughs> so that's what I would say to these women. Okay. So it's just, so you're hot. You're just hot, and that's that. It's just, you, you, you're, you fit my fetish template. And if yeah, you yeah. did a guy, you know, it's, it's really interesting because occasionally I'll hear from uh, women that say, you know, Met a guy, a woman sizes up a guy on a first date. Mm. And every once in a while, she'll say, oh my God, I got to have that guy. But mm. more often she'll say, hmm, can I work with this? <laughs> right? Oh, yes. right? Can I work with this, right? <laughs> guy never says that. A guy either wants to bang her or he doesn't. It's very, very simple. Very simple. There is no work involved. What was it, that book, that MIT book, A Billion Wicked Thoughts? Did you read That's that That's a great one book. Again? It's a great book. What do they say? 17 checkpoints a woman goes through or something. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Through one. Well, he's, well, what those guys say, they say it's a different, you know, to com computer language, you know, in a computer algorithm, there are and algorithms and there are or algorithms. Yeah. Um, and so a woman very often has an and algorithm. It has to be this and this and this. And he has to be able to kiss, right? Good kissing and so forth. Yeah. And there are 17 points to consider, you know, the right amount of tension, the right amount of, you know, it's just like oh, a million things. I've yeah. never had a guy come into my office and say, yeah, she's really not a good kisser. Um, mm -hmm. They never say that. If she meets his <laughs> fetish needs, she meets his needs. And he's not really paying that much attention otherwise. I and had this. The other thing, which I talk about a lot in my book, and I get a lot of heat for it. I had a couple of publishers said they couldn't, they wouldn't touch it. They said it was grating. They didn't like it. They felt really? like re reinforcing gender stereotypes. Um, because, and I say, yeah, look, I don't make the news. I just report it. Yeah. Um, so I, I say, you know, with, with women, you take like the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue read by guys. Yeah. What are the women in this issue doing? They're doing absolutely nothing at all. Yeah. They're just sitting there looking happy. Yeah. A woman just sitting there looking happy can be a turn on for a guy. And often it's the biggest turn on for a guy. Mm. Mm. Now, how about a man sitting there looking happy? That is not a turn on for women. I mean, in Fifty Shades of Grey, he's doing dips, he's doing stuff, he's piloting a glider, you know, he's, he's, he's doing a sailboat, he's making billion dollar deals. Driving his truck, he's I truck. know. Yeah, exactly. But a guy has to do something, you know, yeah. what he do? What's he gonna do? So it's fundamentally different. Yeah. Um, for a guy's attraction to a woman is about being, she doesn't do anything. Um, and women get this wrong all the time, like seven moves to drive him crazy in bed, you know, Cosmo, it's ridiculous. I never have a guy saying, oh, those moves she had. No, if she's his fetish object, she's his fetish object, that's it. And nothing else she needs to do. Man, it's not the same thing. He can't just hang out and look good. You know, we tell a joke in synagogue. How do you get your wife's attention? Sit in a chair and look comfortable. <laughs> she can't find something she wants you to do. <laughs> women like to see men do things. I see women in my office, they go through crises when their husbands retire. You know, yeah. they, what, what's he going to do all day? He's not going to do anything. He's retired. No, no, he's got to do oh, something. That's going to drive us crazy. Yeah. Oh, my God. This is hysterical. But this is a big deal for a woman to sit and be happy. That's a big spiritual request. It's a very big spiritual request. I mean, and, and you know what? And it 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 it, it, uh, it obviously only happens in one part of a relationship, right at the beginning. So when they first fall in love, and she goes, "Oh, I feel so lucky! I have somebody I actually get along with, and we like each other's families, and he gets hard around me, and he likes my body, and we have good sex, and uh, like he's got to makes a decent living, so I'm not going to starve." And, you know, and and just you know, and she feels so lucky, and she's smiling and happy to see him, and he goes, "Oh, this is great! She's smiling and happy to see him. He's safe to come in here because you know a woman's body is kind of like home field. You know, a guy knows no whether it's safe to come in. You know, um, and uh, and then comes the first time he sees her unhappy because mm -hmm. you know, she's unhappy sometimes. It's something, especially if he caused it. 
you yeah. know, and guys don't know what to do with that. Yeah. They do not know what to do with that because they didn't have the thing with girlfriends when they were like 13 and 14, like women had, where, you know, you have fights and you make up and there's rupture and repair and all that stuff. And you're yeah. still friends and so forth. Guys get none of that stuff. So mm. They have no experience. Mm. The last time they were intimate with somebody at that level was their mother. And they separated from their mother forcibly when they were three to become boys who didn't want to be kissed. Yeah. So a guy has been wandering in the desert of intimate relationships all this time. And now he's with somebody who like knows how to do this and says, oh, it's okay, I'm upset. I'm upset. And the guy goes, no, 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 you're upset. And the guy, I, I, I. Um, so one really had to sit him down and said, no, I'm upset. It's okay. It's really okay. I want you to trust me on this. Because the guy freaks out. And he goes, wait a minute, she's upset. I don't want to be around her. And then she feels abandoned. Yeah. And then she's really upset. And yeah. he goes, yeah, I said, it's easy. And, and couples can just like, it becomes, it becomes a devastation there for couples. What's the, the guy, solution? The, the solution is for the guy to know it's okay. She could be upset. Yeah, she's the weather. She's it's like the not, ocean. It's not exactly. It's not the end of the world. She's not a swimming pool. She's the ocean. Yeah. And it's all right. It's really going to be okay. But yeah. It takes the guy a long time to learn that. Mm. Mm. Do you also um, teach women how to express in, in your, your sex counseling, how to express anger, tears, like during sex, a lot of emotions can come. Yeah. Right? And how do you, do you teach women how to communicate in a way that doesn't emasculate him or freak him out? Great. Or is it mainly just guys handle it? It's the weather. It's going to be fine. It's a great question. The best way to handle it is it's the weather. It's going to be fine. Um, but I have this theory um, that, uh, you know, you hear a lot about in sex therapy about inclusiveness and uh, LGBTQ and BDSM and non-gender binary and so forth. And, you know, we don't include talk about, you go to a sex therapy meeting, it's all about all this alphabet, all, all these things. I think myself, you know, you guys are missing something. Mm. Heterosexual relationships, just regular old straight monogamous heterosexual relationships are the most difficult of all mm. because they're, they're, they're just like, the, the, the minds are very, very different. He says, you're always criticizing me. And she goes, I have 4,000 critical thoughts and I only mentioned one. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a really big, it's a big difference. And I think these things, I think, you know, it's important to have a little sympathy for how difficult it is to be in a heterosexual relationship. It's not an easy thing. Mm. Mm. What do you think has been the main key for your marriage? Oh. Alive that you, that maybe you share in the book or she doesn't want you to share that. Either. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, oh, easy. I like yeah. the way she smells. Yeah, that's it. And she feels the same way. Really? Yeah, totally. That's it. Stop. I swear. You yeah. just like snuggle each other and smell each other? We just like to smell each other. That's it. Yeah. And we, we you know, we, you know, um, we actually have a, a little bit of an unusual relationship in that uh, um, we're religious. Um, so we're like, we're, I'm actually like a religious Jew, you know, like uh, with the kosher and the Sabbath and everything. I don't put yeah. that in the book. Although there's a couple of quotations from Genesis in the book, so you know you can kind of get the idea. Uh -huh. And uh, I didn't because my agent said you shouldn't make a big deal of that because the publishers are all self-hating Jews or whatever. So you know, and so you know, a religious Jew goes to synagogue, yes, and the men sit on one side and the women sit on the other side. Yeah. And so there's a separation, and the separation is erotic. Mm. And so I believe that that difference, that separation is the most erotic thing mm. and so you know um we get together it's a welcome back from the separation so it's nice oh that's so beautiful thank i'm you. so glad we're talking about this thank you um, my son's uh father is, is jewish and and did all we did all the ceremonies and i think it's beautiful and i'm i traveled the world i love learning about different religions i'm very i would say i'm very spiritual yeah. but very curious about um, the sacredness of all these different rituals. And there's something to be said. And I was just on an interview the other day, you know, does the heart distance makes the heart grow fonder. And I think about the waves of the ocean. I think about our breath yes. in okay. and out and to think that we need to be together all the time and that there's something wrong in the aloneness. Well, to me, the aloneness is when I return to self and, and God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? And yeah. God is my lover. Like ultimately yeah. I, I'm, I'm use, use me. Use yeah. me, penetrate use, me. Use me, use me. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, a lot of couples um, make the mistake. We talked about this early on of thinking their their mission 
in yeah. a relationship is to take care of the other person. Mm. I think that is a really, really hazardous thing. Tell me more. In the, in the process, people deplete themselves. Mm, yes. And they get resentful and they think, hey, I've been trying to take care of you. I did all this for you and so forth. And you don't appreciate it and so forth. Um, I just don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. I don't think it's a good idea. And, you know, I, I uh, traditionally, traditional religious teaching about sex, Jewish, Christian, does the same thing. It mm. says you take care of the other person. You, you take it, and I go, you know, that gets really old after a while. Um, uh, my notion is that uh, you tell the other person what you want. Yeah. And they'll tell you what they want. And it's usually going to be incompatible. <laughs> um, and so you want A, they want B, and the trick is to find C. Mm. And once you find C, then you both got a piece of C, and that's your creation. And you both got skin in the game now. And so you're going to really work with C. And that's the way to make it work. And so I go through this with couples all the time um, because, you know, it would be a nice thing if before you dated somebody, you filled out a questionnaire, you know, like cunnilingus, don't like cunnilingus, that kind of thing. But you know, people don't have these kind of questionnaires. Um, and so uh, the, uh, you know, he, some, some guys, it's like their favorite thing in the world. Just cunnilingus is that their favorite thing in the world. And then when they have intercourse, they're disappointed because they're farther away from the vagina, you know? <laughs> you know? Their favorite thing in the world. And uh, there's some women that like it, and many women like it, and some women, it's just like, it doesn't do anything for them. You know, they're just waiting for penetration. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you get a couple like that where the uh, the guy's his favorite thing in the world. The world the woman just doesn't do anything for it. And they have to come to the point of saying, okay, it's all right. He just does it for himself. He just yes. does it for himself. And it's okay with her, but it's just like not going to rock her world. And that's got to be okay with him. Yeah. And so, okay, your needs are a little bit different. It's fine. Mm -hmm. I love this. Um I've been doing intimacy coaching for 20 years and across the board, these dating apps, they meet people, they do all this intimacy work, they heal their heart, they learn how to communicate, they speak their truth and they get on these apps and other people haven't done the work and they get so devastated. That very first tough conversation about sex, they're ghosted, yeah. Yeah. this kind of thing. So I've started, I believe it's the world's first partnering app. And the idea is we become the one to find the one, to keep the one. So there's intimacy training, it's like a trinity. There's like intimacy training. Everybody in the app is doing the intimacy training. And every Friday, we're doing these live conscious connection calls where I teach them dyads. I teach them how to have deep, meaningful, uncomfortable, intimate conversations. And all you get to say is thank you back and forth with total strangers. So it's not like, oh my God, are they the one? It's like, no, we're learning how to communicate. And the couples, you go from, it's called heartmates, heartmates for singles into heartmates for couples. And so the couples can then come on and practice these communication okay. where, just like what you're saying, the mission is not to take care of each other. The mission is instead of two halves completing each other. Right, which is two, doesn't work. Totally doesn't work. It's two divorces, I get this. Uh, so two, uh, two holes come together. So one and one isn't two, one and one is infinity. Mm -hmm. And I call that instead of a whole mate relationship, I call it a heart mate. That's the name of my app, heart mates. Okay. And so I so love the C the co-creation together okay. where exactly. two poles can create something beyond uh, that they've ever, that never would have existed if you two of you hadn't met. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing. We're saying the same thing. I so love this. So you're not like my way, your way, or this idea of I'm um, somehow less compromising. No, we're co-creating something even more amazing. Exactly. But it's, it's not going to be either what either of us originally had in mind. Right. Yeah. Well, you have to let go of control, let go of, uh, your conclusions, your assumptions, all the rest of it, and let it be, and let it be. And so how, so again, with this, you know, fresh or fabulous sex over time, you, you, you go into assumptions. You think, you know what the other one wants. You've already talked about it. This is what she wants on Mondays. This is, you know, how do you keep it? How do you stay open? Like literally open, like this person has never occurred on this day with all their past history and all their willingness to have new possibilities. This exactly. moment has never happened before. Well, you know, I, I talk about several, uh, Techniques is a bit of a challenge because all of the, the traditional sex therapy techniques were written in the 20th century. People had a lot more free time. Um, mm -hmm. And they also had a lot more patience. These days, the traditional tech, sex therapy techniques, people get bored with. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I like very quick sex therapy techniques. Okay. Um, so my favorite is yeah. uh, what I call the simmer, um, okay. which is what uh, teenage uh, partners do when they have a break between class for three minutes before the bell rings. Okay. In one of their lockers, 
They inhale the scent of each other's hair. Okay. And bodies. Their bodies mold to each other. They breathe together. They make out. They kind of feel each other. They feel excited, and then the bell rings, and they go off in separate directions. Uh -huh. Now, there's no reason that married people and partner people can't do the same thing. Right. Um, all you have to know is that arousal doesn't always have to lead to sex. Mm -hmm. A lot of people treat arousal like something, you know, and I don't want to get aroused. Like, I don't want to have a fever. I have to take a Tylenol or something like that. No, no, it's okay. You can get aroused. It can come and go. Um, you can feel aroused and then unaroused, especially a lot of women, including a lot of women sex therapists I talk to. They go, well, if he gets hard, I have to like take care of him, right? And, no, you don't. We like to get hard. It's okay. It can go up and they can go down again. Um, and they go, no, wait a minute. I'm not teasing him. If he gets hard and I don't do anything. No, no, we like that. Um, and I have them go home and ask their husbands. They go, yeah, he said it was right. Um, so, um, arousal doesn't mean obligation. Exactly. And so uh, you can be enjoyed for its own sake. So yeah. anytime you kiss your partner, you should simmer them instead. So in the old days when people would go off to work, you know, simmer them off to work. Don't kiss them off to work. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. in, before you go to bed at night, instead of kissing them good night, you simmer them good night. You know, why waste it? And people get confused with simmering and cuddling. It's not cuddling. It has some sexual energy going on. Yeah, yeah. So, and it lasts a minute or two. Just you always simmer. Because otherwise, you know, your average partner, your average committed couple these days, it's gone down over the decades, has sex about once a week. Mm. It's just not enough to keep an erotic connection. So I think for 21st century couples, it's really the simmering when the sex is going to keep you together. And so it really just keeps the erotic climate in the relationship where it needs to be. And so... Do you encourage your, your clients to have more sex, genital copulation, more than once a week? Or do you oh, just encourage no, no, simmering? I, no, I, I live in, I, li I don't know what it's like where, where you are, but in Manhattan, nobody who's not dating for the first two months has sex on the weeknights. Nobody does. Um, nobody does. People have commutes, they get Facebook, they get email. They're, oh, yeah, for, forget it. Nobody has sex during the week. People wow. only have sex on weekends, and it's usually once a weekend. That's, that's the national average these days. For wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even so, single, even so the single. rest, but, but it's okay. But it's okay yeah. because it's the simmering that keeps you alive. It's wow. not sex. The sex is just to celebrate at the end of the at, at the end of the week. But you're you're feeling erotically connected all the time because you're okay. simmering all the time. So do you and because this is me, Loma's intimacy expert here. To me, intimacy is not genital copulation. It's having this intimate relationship with your body and life and the yeah, nature yeah. and the, the yeah, God yeah. and like I I probably don't simmer 24 seven, but I, I commit to simmering. I didn't know we were going to call it this, but that's my way of being to keep me alive and vibrant. And I wear glitter on my shirts. And like, I just, that's how I simmer. Exactly. And, and part of that is you're a woman, you know, a woman puts on sexy underwear. She feels turned on. Totally. A man puts on sexy underwear. He doesn't feel turned on. Um, it's a whole different thing. Um, so a man needs what to be turned on? Um, well, he usually needs an object to be regarding or thinking about. Men don't have erotic self-focus like women do. A woman puts on a scent, she puts, she does a dance, she does it, she feels turned on. She gets turned on all by herself. Yeah. Um, I have a colleague, Marta Miana at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She, she, she did some questionnaires online to study this. She, she asked men and women, would you like to have sex with yourself? And a lot of women said, oh yeah, yeah, I really would like to. Guys didn't even understand the question. Uh, <laughs> so, do you feel you passionately writing your book and doing your purpose and living, like helping these couples and having your time on your side of the synagogue, et cetera? Like, does, does that all like, I don't know what the right word would be, like turn you on to be alive, like uh, awaken your eros? No? Um, well, you know, I, 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 have a, I have to be a little bit, uh, I think I have to kind of plead the fifth on this one because it would probably be saying too much. You know, I, you know, you know but, 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 but it's a great question. And um, I would say um, that I get a tremendous amount of pleasure yeah. by uh, helping people have good sex. Yeah. And it's just, it's just phenomenal. It's the greatest thing in the world. I, and I get a tremendous amount of pleasure um, writing things that help people having good, have, have good sex because you know that's not an easy thing to do to get things on paper that really evoke a feeling. So that gives me a lot of pleasure too. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm naturally kind of a bit of a bookwormish individual. I'm not somebody who would wear glitter or anything like that. I was the pre-med in college. You know, we were kind of a studious guy. So, so it's a little more sublimated than what you're saying, I think. But yeah, sure. But don't you think that would support couples as well? Not just waiting for these three minutes of simmering morning and night, but like simmer all day, be have pleasure all day and why you're on the planet and giving your genius and loving that, being alive? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think... Um, for most couples, if they could just get that a little bit more when they're simmering, I think that would be a big, big improvement because mm -hmm. a lot of couples don't have, don't do that. And then if they're going to take the next step of doing what you're doing, um, the problem is that not many people can handle that. What not do you mean? Many people, not many people can handle that much arousal all day long and still concentrate because one of the things about arousal is it tends to make you a little goofy. You know, you know, people are sexually aroused when they arrive, when they arrive late to meetings. Um, <laughs> if we arrive at all. So for most of us, um, it, it just, it's, it's like, we're, we're, we're having about as much arousal as we can handle. And so uh, most people kind of a, a little worried that if they get a little more aroused more during the day, they really would start to forget things. And they probably would, you know, that's, that's not a bad thing though. Maybe we're a little too perfectionist of, of a community. I don't know. Well, but you know, you gotta pay your bills and stuff, you know, I mean, you, you gotta get things done and you know, people could be leaving things half done and so forth. And, you know, Forget people are leaving their umbrellas all in the corner. It's like, wouldn't, it wouldn't be terrible. It wouldn't be terrible. Um, but I, I have a feeling that, that uh, what you're saying there, there are some tremendously gifted individuals who can function very well in a state of arousal. Um, well, I don't think that many people can. I think most people have to kind of like turn it off every once in a while just so they can get their work done. Well then, because I'm not a doctor, you're the doctor and I hear what you're saying, but is there, what is the scientific difference between desire, pleasure, arousal? Ah, okay. Like, There's no difference. It's all the same thing. Oh, it's all the same thing. It's well, all the same thing. To me, maybe I'm a, a, a unique individual, but I am very you're sad, very cranky. depressed, you're very cranky, yeah. very competitive uh insecure when i'm not having pleasure being alive and when i have pleasure in my underwear pleasure in the sunshine pleasure in my cup of coffee okay. pleasure talking to you i'm happy confident generous and successful yeah so that is uh that is a gift uh and not everybody has that gift hmm. um i think it's also a little more common in women than it is in men do um, you remember that TV show uh, that used to be Hoda and Kathy Lee? It was the, like the third hour of Good Morning America or something like that. Maybe, yeah. Where they were sitting there at 10 or 11 o'clock with glasses of white wine. <laughs> you remember that? No, but that's, that would be a bad, bad news for me. Start wine. Now, 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 what would the show have looked like if there were two guys sitting yeah. there at 10 a.m. with glasses of white wine? People would have said, they're bums. They're bums. <laughs> okay. A yes. woman sits, sits by the fire, luxuriating, half naked, with a fur and the fire and a glass of wine. She looks great. Yeah. The guy sits by the fire with a fur, luxuriating. People go, what's he doing? He should be out chopping wood. You know, so guys, it's a different gig. It's a different gig. We don't, men don't celebrate pleasure in our, in our society. And I believe they don't celebrate pleasure in most societies. Ours is probably worse than most, though. Mm -hmm. Women are privileged in a way. They're privileged to be able to celebrate pleasure in a way that guys culturally are not really. Um, you know, a woman goes on the internet or on Twitter and says, oh, I'm a sex toy reviewer. Oh, I got off so hard with this sex toy. It was fabulous. A guy does the same thing. <laughs> not the same. Not the same. Men are expected to do things. They're not expected to just sit and have pleasure. Um, yeah. I Fair, fair enough. I mean, if you looked at my desk right now, I've got my little thing of glitter. I'm sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got my little sensual oil. And yeah, stuff. yeah. But it's, but it's also a difference between men's and women's brains. Mm -hmm. um, my, my kids, uh, when they were growing up in different years, they had the same teacher. And I, I was trying to think about this. And I asked the teacher one time at a parent-teacher conference, I said, any difference between the boys and the girls? She goes, oh, are you kidding? It's two different species. She goes, the boys... I have this beautiful fountain pen. I wear it around my neck. The entire year, no boy ever noticed my fountain pen. Mm. The girls, the first 10 minutes of class, they're around, they want to see my fountain pen, they want to touch it, they want to use it. They're noticing everything. Yeah. It's a different species. 
What do you think then is the highest use of a woman's willingness to celebrate pleasure more often in terms of keeping a relationship thriving? Oh, I would say um, to make sure that she feels happy enough so he can experience her being happy. Yeah. That's nice. And not to criticize him if he can't necessarily do that exactly like she can. Mm. Mm. Because his nature is different. Yeah. Um, he's, a, he's a little bit more, uh, he's usually a little bit more pedestrian. Uh, he's usually a little bit more, I want to have a good meal, I want to sit down, I want to watch the ball game, and then I want to fall asleep. Um, mm. You know, people talk about what do women want. Nobody talks about what men want. We don't want that much. You know, mm. we just want to be left alone a lot of times. Mm. And we want not to be criticized for not being women. Um, yes. As a mental health professional, you know, it used to be, did you ever read the book in a, in a, in a different voice by Carol Gilligan? Mm -hmm. It was a fabulous book written in the seventies. And it was a response to a hundred years of academic psychology saying that women were inferior because their minds were more relational and things were more relative and less absolute. Yeah. And she said, no, no, they're not inferior. They're just different. It's in a different voice. Yeah. These days it's a complete opposite. In the mental health field, women are regarded as superior and men are regarded as inferior. Mm -hmm. Men are regarded as problematic. They're mm -hmm. difficult. They not as psychologically minded. They're not as well related and so forth. And I say, you know, you can make the same statement. We're just different. Yeah. We're just different. Mm -hmm. um, we're not inferior. So that, that would be my plea. Don't, don't regard your husband as inferior. He's just different. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. That just kind of hurts my heart a little bit. Okay. Um, in ten, like in this tender way. I have a, I have an eighteen-year-old boy. Um, okay, yeah, he's just different. He's just different yeah. because men, yeah. men get really, really, men get really abused these days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I see on Twitter, a woman says, "If he doesn't go down on me on the first date, forget it. He's out of there." Mm -hmm. Can you imagine a man saying, "If she doesn't blow me on the first date, she's out of there." There'd be a revolution if he said that. Totally. But totally. A, woman can, a woman can say that. A woman can act entitled to pleasure. Mm. A man cannot. A man cannot act entitled to pleasure or he's abusive. Um, but a woman can act entitled to pleasure. Um, wow. So it's, there's, there's, it's curious stuff going on in the culture these days. Yeah. And for as a woman to allow a man his man cave time, his alone time and not take it personally or criticize him. This is a really a big gift of what it takes for her to be full and not need anything from him to be okay in her aloneness. Yeah. to honor his aloneness, knowing I believe a good man uses his freedom well and comes back grateful for yeah. his alone time, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, beautiful. So beautiful. now I got to run in just a second. Yeah. Um, and I know your time is limited too. What else should we talk about? If we have one more thing we got to talk about, what should we do? Well, I want everyone to go to Amazon and get Love Worth Making Ridiculous. Huh. <laughs> yeah, everyone grab the book. I'm definitely grabbing the book. Um, and I'm going to get the audio book because I'm doing some driving and I can listen to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to know from your expertise, your life experience and your heart, how do you want to complete the interview? What do you want people to really know? Okay. So what I would say is your erotic self is very, very young. It's a mm -hmm. very, very young part of yourself. Its coping capacities are extremely limited. It gets very hurt. It gets very, very disappointed. And so you just really want to treat it gently and kindly. And, you know, you treat it gently and kindly and you expect your partner to treat it gently and kindly and you treat your partner's erotic self gently and kindly and yeah. be positive. And yeah. uh, everybody can just, uh, you know, somebody wrote, read my book and they said that the main message of the book is relax. It's going to be okay. Mm. Um, and you relax. It's going to be okay. Mm, that's beautiful. You right. are such a delight. Thank you. Well, for listen, it's a pleasure. Pleasure. It's so nice to meet you finally after. I know after all this forever. All right. media time ch chatting. Yeah. All my love to you. All my blessings to you. Please go to Amazon, get love worth making all of you. And uh, if you're in the New York area, I suppose would be a client. Yeah. In, the uh, city? in New York, New Jersey or Connecticut. Yes. Okay. There you go. All right. All right. Until next time. Mwah. All Thank my love. You, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Please.